in lieu of the Super Bowl, I wanted to bring on a real live NFL player for you all so that we can pull back the curtain, get the scoop on what's going on. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can see Jeff Swaim is here. Yay! Let's do this. What up, my butthole breathers? So excited to have you here today. I'm here with Jeff Swaim. I like to call him G off because that's how it looks like it's spelled. And we're here to just hang out, talk, answer some of your most pressing questions and get the behind the scenes of what it's actually like to be in the NFL. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So first, welcome back to Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a while. I, uh, nice to be back. It's nice to have you back and our fun conversations, which we're about to have here. So let's just introduce you to the people. Tell us who you are. Tell us where you came from. And then we'll get into that. Yeah, I'm Jeff. I've played in the league that just finished up my ninth year. My wife and I are both from Northern California. We, we moved to Texas to go to college and then played four years in Dallas, one year in Jacksonville, three with the Titans, and then last year I spent in Arizona. I played tight end. And uh, yeah, I've had a myriad of injuries, soft tissue stuff, and just a lot of things have happened along the way. So yeah, got to talk about it. When did you realize that like, yeah, I'm going to be able to have a shot at the NFL? I never really approached it that way. Like I never, I never made it a goal of mine to play in the NFL. I never made it a goal of mine to play in college. I was in junior college in California playing ball, and my coach had mentioned that I had a chance to play college football. So I, obviously I took it and ran with it and then got an offer to the University of Texas, transferred and played there two years, and – even my time there, I never really considered like trying to play in the league. I just was trying to be good at what I was doing. And then once I got drafted, I was a late round pick. And so I went into training camp my rookie year kind of unsure of like what to make of the NFL, what to make of an opportunity. I just was, I was nervous. I didn't want to screw up and fail. And so I just dove in, you know, like head first and just studied as much as I could and just for anyone who, who's played football knows, like, you just fight your ass off every day to not get beat up and to not lose and not get embarrassed. And that was, like, kind of the life of rookie me. And then I never really thought about the career portion of it for the first probably two years. And then I, I think probably after my second year, going into my third year, I, I had thought, like, man, I could do this more than just – I could make it a career, not just, like, a little blip on the radar. Yeah, and – but I, even like as I've gotten older, it's really just become like kind of a one year at a time and just trying to be good at what I'm doing right now and letting tomorrow kind of worry about itself, you know? Yeah. And so I, we'll get into the physical aspect too. But as you're saying, like it is such a mental game mm -hmm. of that. How do you navigate that? I think for the first portion of my career, I didn't really navigate it. I just kind of like bottled worries and concerns up and compartmentalized things so that I could focus on what I was doing because I wasn't real like adept at handling like my fears and my insecurities and stuff like that. So I just kind of bottled it up, pushed it aside and just moved forward. As you can imagine, that had wonderful effects whenever I couldn't contain it anymore. You know, you, you, everyone you, around you. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> like learning through arguments, learning through injuries and getting cut and moving and, and learning through all these situations being forced to address things as opposed to just pushing them aside because you really can't like if you want to be successful and if you want to have good relationships and make you know everything focused long term it's really hard to do it when you're not actually addressing you know your fears and your insecurities and so getting fired helped you get cut once and you you actually like are forced to deal with like well that sucks and I don't have a job and I don't know what my future holds allowing my wife to like help me and encourage me and not just trying to do everything on my own through my own will, but allowing like God to work on my behalf and then allowing my wife to be the spouse that she wants to be for me. That's helped a ton. And then not trying to be in control of everything and That's just hard. allowing it to kind of be what it's going to be. Yeah. That's really hard. Yeah. So when, there's so much to dive in here, but you specifically said injuries. Mm -hmm. When did you... Have you always been taking care of yourself? Like, when did you figure all that out? I, I know. I, I never did. I never, like, I know nowadays, like, young athletes especially, there's so much at their disposal for 
um, like body work and like preventative measures they can take. And I didn't have any of that. Like when I was in high school, I didn't even like lift weights. I didn't do anything. We did. It was just very like rudimentary. Yeah. yeah. And so when I was in college, it was just go as hard as you can all the time. I never really had injuries. I didn't start getting injured until I, until I got in the NFL. And those injuries compounded over the years. And I didn't have a way of actually dealing with them. I was, I was taking a ton of like anti-inflammatories and Cordol and Indocin and Naproxen and just anything I could to allow me to play. And I never addressed like the root cause of what was, A, what was causing the injury or if I had an injury that wasn't stemming from a, a different issue, just kind of like a freak accident, like when I tore my pec, I, I didn't rehab it the way I probably should have because I just didn't know. And so it was just, hey, get strong and go again. And so I think it, like everything else, it was just through trial and error and, and mistakes and really just being like uneducated about what I needed. I was just running the program that I was given by the training staff and the strength coaches and, and just trying to get on the field. And it worked. I was able to play through injuries and, and do a lot of things. But over the years now, I, the older I get, those injuries have started to catch up with me. And I've had to find other ways of fixing asymmetries and fixing my body and making it work properly as opposed to just finding a compromised solution to allow me to perform. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, like, even over time, of course, I'm all about Western medicine when we need it, an anti-inflammatory or whatever. But if it's your only go-to to help yourself, there's side effects of that on your gut and everything. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, so for, like, the anti-inflammatory stuff, where I've arrived now is, like, I still use them if I need them. Mm -hmm. But I don't take them for headaches. I don't take them for a fever redu reducer. Like, I don't take them for any of those purposes mm -hmm. you know i would take them like on game day if i like this year i yeah i got hit and my like my neck just like popped and so when we had a really long rain delay at halftime and so i was sitting in the at halftime going dude if i don't get a shot i'm not gonna, i'm not going to be able to play like it just i can't move and so i took a shot at halftime and then i was able to finish the game but that's not something i do like i would do it i was taking for the practice i was taking it so i could sit on my couch without pain you know like luckily i found other ways of, of correcting things and actually looking at the cause of why i'm in pain or why i have headaches or and and working at those solutions and i don't need them as much. Mm -hmm. you know I, I went i went two years where i was taking tordol for every game and i was taking it proactively just yeah, like oh you, like, okay. you feel better i won't do that and then i stopped taking everything altogether and then i took tordol once or twice this year but it was just because I needed it, and but I understood what I was doing, and I was okay with it. And mm -hmm. that's that's the main thing. It's like I'm not against Western medicine either, because it's necessary. But, oh, absolutely. But if you're not looking at why, then you, you're missing the boat. Yeah. You're causing maybe potential other issues. Yeah. So does it feel like you got hit by a truck after every game? No. Certain players, I would say, definitely they have that. You know, depending on the position you play. Earlier in my career, I was. At being younger, I was able to just deal with it. And mm -hmm. I've played football since I was shoot, since I was in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So I've never not had, since my sixth grade fall, I've never not had football every year, you know. And so I've, I've gotten used to being in, you know, like, I don't know what level of pain it is because it's just kind of a normal thing for me. So, and I'm not, I'm not in pain all the time, mm -hmm. but like when I do have pain, I don't know how to rank it because mm -hmm. that's all I know, really. Right, your body I don't have another, you, yeah. yeah. Certain games, definitely. I get I get up the next day and I'm like, oh man, that one time I got hit really did it to me. But certain other games I wake up, I feel great. It just depends on how physical the game was, you mm -hmm. know. And as I've gotten older, I've even learned in games how to manage myself, so I'm not taking shots that I shouldn't take while still being oh. effective, you know. But just like when I was younger, it was just I was going as hard as I could every play, no matter what, just unnecessarily getting myself hit mm -hmm. and. Now I've learned to like, hey, if you want to play a full season and not have crazy injuries, you can't redline the whole game. Mm -hmm. And I, like any, I think any pro athlete that you watch that it works at a high level, they don't. It, to me, it doesn't appear that they're pushing themselves to that red line constantly. Mm -hmm. They're picking their spots when they do it, but most of the game they're playing as as a route runner. I see you guys run routes. They're not running 100% speed. 
they take it down just a notch. It makes them more efficient in and out of a cut, mm-hmm. less likely to pull muscles because they're not straining as hard as it, you know, they otherwise would be. And so I didn't understand that. And I was hard, hard, hard. And it's like anything. If you want to run fast and you tense up and try really hard, you're going to run slower. Mm-hmm. You have to play loose and yeah. fluid. And that's kind of something I had to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what do you do, speaking of that, like on game day? Do you have a routine? Does the timing affect your speed all the time? No. So I've, I've always – I would go out when I was younger. I'd go out real early and go out on the field and sweats and throw the ball around and stuff. And as I've got – and I realized that just made me more nervous. And so I don't, I don't go out on Mental the field. game. Yeah, I don't go out in the field before the game at all. I didn't I, think I knew that about you. Yeah, I take the late bus. I get to the stadium as late as I can. I review some my notes from the week. I'm, you know, and I sit in meetings, take notes. So I'll review some notes, and then I try to have all my stuff done by Saturday night, so that Sunday I don't have to. I don't want to go through a bunch of stuff. I just want to set a few reminders, and then just go play. And so, my routine has been, at times, very extensive, like a lot of warming up, a lot of running. And I found that that was just sweating that I didn't need to do. Exercise that tired me, or exhausted me, without giving me. A boost and then I've other times I've done nothing probably to my detriment and I found that the the solution for me is like to do what is necessary so like if I wake up on game day like this past year I've been dealing with like a back issue I would get up and I would be like okay I feel great today I don't need to do anything or some days I'd wake up on game day and my back would be like killing me and so it's like what can we do right now to stop the pain so I can play so sometimes it'd be like I had a game this year I had I had probably 20 needles in my back before the game, trying to get my back to work. This was like, and I think the routine is just like what is necessary. But keeping things, for me, keeping things calm, I don't want to get pumped up. I want to stay calm because I play yeah. my best when I'm calm. I don't play my best when I'm fired up. And oh, I, I love play that. I don't play defense. I don't, yeah. I don't need to get fired up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really excited because he is in Nashville for six weeks so that we yeah. can clean up some of those injuries and performance train. How did you originally find me again? I don't even know. So I was playing with the Titans. I got here in 2020, and then I played three years. So I think, I think it was my second year here. My second year here. That we started I working have to together. Go look at the notes. I forget, but a couple of teammates of mine recommended you because I was having, I had like a hamstring issue, and then I was just, I was just having like tendonitis and just old man stuff, for lack of a better term, like just. Stuff that compounded over the years. I had put on some weight purposely because I was being asked to block more. So I put on some weight, and I was having tendonitis in my Achilles. Double it, both of my Achilles had tendonitis, and I was just tired of like every morning I get up I couldn't walk, and it would take twenty minutes to walk. It was just really annoying, and so I reached out to you, just like, hey, can you fix this? Because I need this fixed, and it's not as simple as like poke, 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 your fix, but it was, it was like a, a start of like progress towards finding out, really uncovering like tendonitis was a symptom. I had Pez and serene tendonitis. I had uh, a hamstring issue. I had all sorts of stuff, and it's, it's stemming from my foot and, and kind of just diving into. And a referral from your low back. And Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like <laughs> just some, we opened a box of problems, and so mm-hmm. we're working our way through it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we got like you haven't complained in a long time of not being able to walk when you get up and yeah, no, like my, being able to perform and yeah. like taking, this is what I say, like you got to find the root cause of the problem so that we can work on neurologically changing how you activate your muscles and, and in these patterns. So like today, he gave me permission to say it, we were in essentially a running stance for him and rewiring how his brain activates through his foot all the way through his glute of, oh, and at the end we did, we had an audit of a calf raise and he was like, oh, my God. And we even could, like, jump and everything else. So if you put yourself in the positions to activate your muscles correctly and your brain realizes that all these pathways open up and the, the sky is the limit. Yeah, and I think, I think, like, for me, the realization was as much as I thought I was – so I, I had a calf injury at mm-hmm. the end of the season. And as much as I thought, like, okay, my muscle needs to heal and repair – like discovering how much the nerve affects my ability to fire the muscle. And like Jeff had told me that like nervous system's king. And so it's not going to hurt itself. Something else down the chain is going to get hurt. So maybe my, some of my issue was the nerves weren't firing properly, stemming back from my initial 
Jones fracture my foot mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah, it's chicken or egg, right? And just, yeah, and just, you know, down the years of wearing inserts in my shoes and just all those problems, thinking that it was a muscular issue, I can do a thousand calf raises, but if I can't get that muscle fire properly, it's not going to fix. Yeah, you're training a terrible yeah, pattern. Exactly. And I've done that. I've just created a habit of just, yeah, pathways of work that are inefficient, but effective in the time being, but in the long term, they create mm. problems. Do you think starting to dive in, potentially this work has extended your career? Yeah. Just, and, and I don't, I'm sorry, I probably could have like figured out a way, but the mental toll that it takes just being constantly annoyed by something bothering you and not knowing why and knowing like, and for me, it was just, I was tired of having issues that I couldn't resolve. And so I was just having to probably make those issues worse by finding temporary band-aids for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, I remember this is, this is way before I met you. I had, I had gotten hit really hard in the head and had a bunch of like scaling issues and trap issues. And I was getting what I thought was concussion symptoms well after, like six months after. And it was just nerves from the back of my head that was causing my face to feel like it was being pulled. Mm-hmm. It gave me light sensitivity, all sorts of issues. And, um, my PT in Texas just started working with like, hey, you know, you tore your pack on the right side, you have trap and scaling issues, all that stuff is pulling up here. And like resolving those issues through working on them was like, it was such a relief because I was like, man, this, I can't play if this is going to be the case. I can't play football anymore, you know? And well, it wasn't a discussion issue. It was a nerve issue coming from a bunch of injuries and rehab on muscles that had caused my shoulder to move in this position putting a bunch of pulling nerves. Yeah. And I think it's like a time that the team is so great and has a great staff, but they take care of how many guys at one time. Like it's a nice time for you to like have whatever that time is focused on just whatever's pressing that yeah. day. Yeah, and, and I think like the, to me, that's what the offseason is for is identifying what I need to, what I need to fix mm-hmm. so that I can play another year. Yep. It, that's just how I'm that's how I'm doing. I want to play another year, I gotta fix this. During the season, like yeah, there's you know, four trainers and there's fifty three, fifty four guys plus practice squad. Like mm-hmm. there's a ton of people they're mm-hmm. working on. And a lot of it has to be I have to be able to identify what's going on with me. You know, because it's really hard from a second set of eyes to identify what's going on. You have to be able to at least be somewhat knowledgeable that you can communicate. You Absolutely. Know, um and, and advocate for yourself. Yeah, advocate for myself, but also just actually understand what I'm feeling and what's happening. Oh, this hurts. Like, you no, know, what's actually, am I feeling a nerve pain? Am I feeling sharp? Is it, yeah. dull? like, where is it coming from? What activates it? What makes it feel better? Yes. Oh. Just stuff like that. But, yeah. like, that's the, being able to understand what's going on with yourself. And that's the same thing with, like, we talk about, like, the diet and stuff mm-hmm. too. Like, actually auditing myself and finding out, like, oh, this makes myself worse. This makes me better. And I never asked those questions before because I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into that. Talk to me about your diet. What you got? Nothing crazy. I mean, just my wife had told me that. She goes, you should, when you eat food, you should take a second to think about how did that make me feel? Like, do you feel bloated afterwards? Do you feel energetic? Do you have a sugar crack? Like, what, what do you like? And it just made me start thinking, I've never thought about that before, ever. I just eat food and then I go do stuff and then, you know, I may feel tired or I may feel bloated, but I didn't really link it to what I was eating. I was just like, that's how life is. And I don't have any sage wisdom on what to eat. It's more just like I had to start actually figuring out what made me feel good and what didn't make me feel good and when to, when to eat certain foods and when not to eat certain foods, you know? And so like for me in the off season, I try not to eat as many grain carbs. Because in the season, I need them all the time for energy, and I'm, I'm running, and I'm doing stuff. And that appetite, when the season ends, the appetite doesn't go away. And so if I'm not careful, I'll eat the same thing like I'm training, and then I'm just going to gain weight, and it's going to be fat. And so in the off season, I cut out not all, but a lot. I eat a lot more fruit, and then I just, I've modified my diet that way. But the big one, like everyone knows, like sugar, 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 sugar. Don't have crap sugar, especially at night so what do you eat the night before a game and on game day? So this is exactly the opposite of what I just said. But <laughs> the night before the game, whatever the, the team meal is, I'll have. 
So mm -hmm. make sure I get a lot of protein. But then I have ice cream for oh, but not for a game. Vanilla ice cream with a cookie. Usually. Okay. Did this start like years it, ago? No, it started in Tennessee. Johnu, when I played with Johnu, he would do that for every game. And I was like, and I was like, well, damn, dude. Like, John is all shredded and yoked mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm not. And I was like, well, he can do it. <laughs> I just started doing it just as like a, and now it's just a habit. I have a, I don't even really eat ice cream, but the night before the game, I have vanilla ice cream and like a cookie. And then, uh, yeah, at the end of the day of the game, I, some guys play on an empty stomach. I eat, I usually eat in the morning, um, Three to four eggs, an avocado, um, bacon. Oh yeah. A ton of fruit, and usually like I was, they usually have like a or a water a liter, a old thing of water with with an element, and then after that I usually have coffee. And then. What's your favorite flavor of element? Mine's raspberry. Okay, there was a grapefruit salt that oh, yeah. I really liked. Okay, I like yeah, fruit. they so have that. I like that. That was a good one. And then, what's the green one? Is it like citrus? A, yeah, like a yeah. That one's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's Lauren's favorite too. My mm -hmm. wife. That's like her favorite. So I usually pick the other ones because she really likes the green ones. What a good husband! Yeah, you know, leave her the green. Speaking of her, they have an amazing family. How do you manage keeping everything like normal at home when you're working? I mean, mm. the lifestyle is a little bit nuts. I mean, you are in season, then off season, and it's just. A, crazy schedule like how do you guys purposely maintain your sense of normal well I, honestly i think the 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 most important thing because i wasn't like i got in the league i was 21 so i'm 30 now and when i was i didn't understand how to do life in football i never had a career i was just kind of jumped into something i had no idea how to do but i was like a rookie i had been married for maybe a year or something like that and so we just jumped in and my wife is a like a go-getter. She's like a workhorse. And so she was just, when I got in the league, I said, you know, why don't you take some time and just like relax for a little bit? Because when I was in college, she just worked like a dog to help me. And anyway, so she took a little bit of time. And what I found was that her her approach of like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do everything I can to help my husband really was A was necessary because I wasn't mature enough to understand how to manage my own life. So, like, she had to help find our help with our tax people. She had to, you know, like, pay our bills. And just because I didn't know what I was doing. And I was lazy and didn't want to. So, you know what I mean? So, like, that's that was super necessary. And I have matured somewhat. Not, yeah, a little bit. Somewhat? Um, You're getting your stride. I'm trying to, like, take more of a, like, just take some of that burden off of her. She shouldn't carry that all the time. Um, The main thing is just, like, communication and like i said earlier like allowing my wife to help me and her allowing me to help her and mostly it's like it's a, it's always a struggle of like pride about how much i can carry and i don't need help and all this you know that that the stupid stuff that I she I, does that too i'm sure a hmm. little bit huh probably i mean i think we all do to a degree i know i certainly do it a lot and then well i can't carry all this by myself so i do need help mm -hmm. and it's better if I just tell her, hey, I need some help with this. And so. I'll do a little bit more of that, I think. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it so hard? Well, I think it's pride. I, th I think it's pride. Honestly, I think it's, it's a prideful. I can, I can, through my own will, do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, no, you can't. And that's, but that's the truth, I think, for most people. It's like, you can't do everything by yourself. You do need help. You do need to trust people. You do need to be able to be vulnerable and ask for help. And I'm real bad at that. But my wife's good at helping. And so, and then after we've had kids and stuff, like the necessity of being on the same page and patient with one another and really focused on like, how can I serve my family is like, that's the most important thing. And so I've, I've had to learn that and I'm still learning it. Like I'm by no means good at it, but I'm realizing how important that is. Yeah. Work in progress every day. Yes. Some days are better than others. Yes. So if there wasn't football, what do you think you'd be doing? I don't know. When I got done, when I was in junior college and I got done with that, I went to Texas. But I had a, I had this thought, like, when I got out of high school that I wasn't going to play football anymore because mm -hmm. I didn't have a, a scholarship to mm -hmm. go play. So I thought I was going to go, my dad's a painter, I thought I was going to go work with him. 
if I hadn't played football, that's probably what I would have done. Okay. Now that I'm older and, and I've made a career of this and, and I have opportunity now to kind of do what I want, the short answer is I don't know what I want to do. I, I, love, I love being outside. I love working with my hands. I've had some, I have had a buddy of mine who is exploring like cows and doing that kind of thing. And so I've kind of sort of jumped in with him a little bit there, seeing if I like it and enjoy it. And, but outside of that, I don't have a, I don't have a plan. That's okay. And I've, I used to be like, I used to hear that all the time. You got to start working on your second career. And there's some truth there, Mm -hmm. but there's, I, I do, I really do believe that it's hard to be really good at what you're doing if you're thinking about what's next or thinking about the the fallback plan and i was just young and dumb and so i just like my only shot of at the time my thought process was like my only thought shot of being successful was like i gotta be good at football and so i just dove in and like i just i did whatever i had to do to be successful and while i while i probably could have expanded other areas of my life and had some growth and whatever to me that approach has been really important because i think if you want to be good at anything you really have to dive into what you're doing and it doesn't mean you shouldn't have safety nets or fallback plans necessarily but for me it's been that's that sense of urgency that that creates of just having one avenue forces my work ethic and so and i found that too with like contracts and everything like i've i'm at i'm kind of a sort of a journeyman and so i've been on a lot of one-year contracts and not having guaranteed anything past the year that you're currently in has really forced my like can't, you can't get complacent you are always having to work and work and work and that's been good for me because it, yeah, i've had to learn it you know and i've had to learn how to stay hungry and not get lazy because my natural position is lazy you know and so like i can't do that yeah if i want to be good and yeah. you know and so i don't know what's next but whatever i do i'm gonna dive into that too forces you to be present like you only yeah. have so much mental bandwidth in a day and like you're always like you're saying planning other things not focused in the moment focused on whatever that stress is good or bad yeah. it's gonna take that i don't know take those whatever you have left yeah i agree and like there's that there's that expression in the bible like sufficient for today are the troubles thereof mm-hmm. like you got enough to worry about right now and if i'm thinking way down the road i can miss what's important now and like you said the being present in what you're doing it's, it's a really hard thing to do. It's, it's not our default position. Yeah, physically we're present in what we're doing, but is our mind focused on what we're doing 100%? Are we actually into what we're doing? You know, and I see that when I'm, I'm doing anything. It's like it, it's hard to focus on what you're doing. At the time. And, but that's, the true, that's true not just in the moment, in the small things, but in the big picture as well. Like what am I focused on? What am I looking at? Am I looking down the road and the what ifs? Am I living in that world or am I living in the world I'm at now? And that kind of brings up another question that popped in my head. So football is especially known for all the alpha males Mm -hmm. and the positional tiers of quarterback and everything else. How do all these guys who are most of them alpha, like on a team now that you've been on a bunch of teams, like how is that? How do you come together? I don't know. The image when you said that that popped in my head was like if you had a bunch of dogs, like the the big bad dog would be the leader dog and the other ones are just kind of like, Okay, that's what we're doing. Okay. And I think there's some truth in that. Like, on a team, you see who your leaders are based on, like, or who, who's the guys that's producing, who are the guys that the offense, for us, the offense runs mm-hmm. through. And those are the guys that are hopefully also the right kind of character people who can actually be leaders and not just in positions of, like, authority, but actually in those positions of authority because they're competent and they're good leaders. And so... You know, there, I'm sure there are, you know, there's bad character people in every profession and every walk of life, and that's certainly true in the league too, but there are so many people that are motivated to be really good at what they're doing, and I think it's just the necessity of, if you're not good, you're going to get fired. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know how it is, I, look, this is all I've ever done for my job, I don't know anything else, but I would imagine there are professions where you are able to be less than your best and still have a job and there's probably a, to a smaller degree that's sort of true in the league there are probably are guys that post by but by and large if you're not good you're going to get fired because they're trying to find the best collection of players and so that that motivation to be oriented towards the right goals it's kind of built in 
you can't afford to be in something and not actually working hard because you're not going to last. And yeah, so hopefully you have the coaches are finding in the GM or finding players that are really, really good, but also good leaders. But yeah, it's like anything. Like if you have a bunch of people that are similar, especially like the alpha type of people, like, yeah, there's going to be conflict and there's going to be that stuff, but that kind of comes with it. It's hard to have that collection of people and not have that. And so I wouldn't even, I, I don't, and I don't think it's desirable to avoid those conflicts either because you need that sometimes. You need to be challenged. You need to be, it needs to be competitive, you know. So, so what do you make a good leader then? I don't know. I, I, I don't know entirely what makes a good leader. One of the best qualities that I've found in coaches are people that are just authentically themselves. And I'm speaking as a coach, right? So like, okay. it's hard to listen to a coach that you don't believe is being real. Mm-hmm. And that's true, like any boss, anyone, that's true in life. It's hard to, especially someone who's telling you what to do and trying to motivate you and trying to get us all to focus on a common goal. If I think what they're telling me, whether they're telling me the truth or not, if it appears that they're not being who they genuinely are, it's gonna be hard to listen to that every day. And so, um, and you can be, can be commanding and rah rah. You can be quiet. I don't. It doesn't matter. You have to be authentic to who you are. And so, the good coaches I've been around have had that. They're just themselves. I've been around coaches who were will yell at you, scream at you, and I was sort of okay with it because like that's who that person is. He's not pretending. Oh, so okay. I can manage that. I've been yeah. around coaches who are very soft spoken, and and that's been okay too. But the best quality of a leader is guys who who do the right thing and exemplify that all the time. That's the best quality in a leader, probably. That almost brings like a tear to my eye. That's so true. Like you I said that so eloquently. That's I think a it's big true. word. Yeah. Big word. That was a good word. Good like word. It. So you have the mic right now and you can even drop it. Like what do you wish more people in general knew either, well, you can say, you can make this like an A and B section, maybe about football and then maybe just about life in general through what you've learned in your career. Okay. Okay, for football, I watched so I was I played for the Cardinals this year. We weren't we weren't in the playoffs, so I was watching the playoffs. And I watched the game and I'm watching the game from like a football perspective. So I'm kind of watching the game within the game and seeing when timeouts are called, how much time's on the clock, situational stuff and I would explain that to like my mother-in-law or my wife or something. I'd be like, "All right," so like, and they probably don't care, but they're humoring me, you know. So I pause the TV. All right, so here's what happened, and I'm like explaining it real in depth, you know. And the beside just the physical aspect of football, there's so much that goes into the strategy behind the game. Oh yeah. And I didn't really understand it until I played in Tennessee. Like I got a really detailed perspective on situational football when I played in Tennessee. And now I look at the game through that lens. And if people, the average fan, could see the game through that lens, they would have a huge appreciation for not just like how athletic someone is or the great catch they made or how tough someone is, but they would have this huge appreciation for just how intelligent a lot of players have to be to not only physically do the job, but also mentally be aware of the situation they're in and make the appropriate maneuver, mm-hmm. you know, after the play's over for clock management or anything like that. And, and like that to me is a really impressive thing to be able to balance the physical aspect of football and also the mental aspect of football. And I don't think it's, it's just not highlighted because it's not, it's not understood well enough to be told. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So people don't see it. Right. But yeah, that would be a, that would be something. If, if people saw it, they would be blown away. That's really cool. Yeah. And then just in life? No, that's a good question. But something along the lines of, like, approach your, approach your life and your, your circumstance or your direction you want to go in. Approach those things with, like, the seriousness that they require because you're ultimately the only one that bears the consequence of it. You know, and so, like, I deferred a lot of decision making in my life and a lot of hard conversations like we were talking about earlier, having hard conversations, just things that have to happen if you want the life to have a chance of going the right direction. You know, you can do all the right things and, and life still may not work out well. But 
you certainly won't have success if you're not doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So it just it just increases the likelihood that your life is going to turn out the way you want it if you approach it the right way and just live in the world that you are responsible for the direction your life heads. And you can't control any sort of outside influence. You can't control the extenuating circumstance, but you can control how you operate. And just having not done that a lot and then trying to do that more, I've realized just how important it is and how, how encouraging it is to see yourself making progress towards making progress on a personal objective and not like career-wise, but just like, hey, I'm, I'm not great at handling this mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm actually trying and I'm working on it and I can see the progress. That's a really encouraging thing. And once you get a taste of that, you realize how much more you can do, you know, how much more capable you are than you give yourself credit for. And yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we've established you're a guy that wants to be better, not only body, but mentally, all the things. Yeah. Like, what do you think is the greatest sacrifice you've had to make for football? For football. I think it would just be, like, things that I have to not participate in. So, like, you know, I, I, I don't go out and party. Up, well, it's not my personality. I don't do that anyway. But, like, just things that would be easy to do, you can't do if you want to be good. And, and I'm not, like, this dominant, you know, all-time player, but – in order to be successful in the opportunity and avenue that I'm in in football, there's just stuff I can't do. And I think besides that, like that's a probably a smaller aspect of it. The bigger aspect of it is like just working working on myself and sacrificing like what I want now, what brings me temporary comfort and temporary relief for like the thing that I want in the future. So it's just the principle of sacrifice for the future. It's not something specific. It's more of just a category of like, if I want to have a better future, there's things I can't do right now. And that's really just discipline, you know. And, and so it's as simple as like, I binge on sugar and eat a bunch of dessert and now I feel like crap. And well, now future Jeff has to suffer because of that. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. It's as, you know, maybe more complex, like, have to really work at being patient and not seeing the world through I'm the most important person in it and everyone has to work around me and realizing that everyone else is just as important as me and trying to work through relationships and communication with people in a way that's like considerate of them and realizing that that's going to be better for my future than it is and better for all my relationships than it is if I'm stuck in me first things and so just the sacrifice of like trying to um, change my perspective because it's necessary. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, and like, if I want to have good things in the future, I can't keep doing the bad things now. I have to fix those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, this has been so good. We've learned so <laughs> much. But I love it. So this is the NFL, people. I hope we were able to answer some of your questions today. Jeff, thank you for being here. And I'm so grateful to be part of your team. Thanks for letting me ramble. I appreciate it. <laughs> Toodaloo.